Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Ani Zargaryan, and on behalf of the Armenian National Committee of Eastern Massachusetts, I welcome you. We are delighted to host Professor Milena Stereo, a scholar of international law and human rights this evening. For 88 days, the Azeri government has held the Armenians of Artsakh hostage with a clear intent to drive them out of their ancestral homeland. This act, as noted by the Lemkin Institute and the International Association of Genocide Scholars, is a premeditated act of ethnic cleansing, ringing genocide alarm bells from many corners around the world. This most recent belligerence was preceded by the war in 2020, and the war in 2016, and the war in the 90s, the almost nonstop border skirmishes for the past 30 years, the use of white phosphorus weapons on populations, pogroms in Sumgait, Maraga, and other locations, all laced with a heavy dose of violent acts of civilian and military POW beheadings on live camera and other gruesome mutilations of Armenians. While psychotic in nature, these are calculated state-sponsored acts to kill, and most importantly, to sow the seeds of fear in people's minds. Yet, the international community is suggesting that the Armenians of Artsakh find ways to live peacefully as part of Azerbaijan. This is akin to advising battered and raped women to go back to the predator and just find a way to live in peace together a grotesque and unconscionable suggestion at the individual level, yet one offered by democratic states with a straight face to the entire population. International law establishes that specific groups are entitled to self-determination, that they have the right to auto-determine their political fate. The right of self-determination clearly applies to colonized and subjugated peoples. It should not only be possible, but also highly advisable to argue that this right apply to oppressed groups whose rights have been severely violated by their parent state. Self-determination is typically exercised through secession, whereby the relevant group secedes from the territory of its parent state to join another state or to form its own independent state. Tonight, Professor Stereo will discuss the right to self-determination as well as a process of secession in the context of Artsakh. And she will analyze whether the people of Artsakh are entitled to exercise the right of external self-determination through remedial secession or other means. As the managing director of the Public International Law and Policy Group, Professor Stereo is a leading expert on international law, international criminal law and human rights. She is one of the six permanent editors of the prestigious Law Girls blog and a frequent contributor to the blog focused on international law, policy and practice. In the spring of 2013, Professor Stereo was selected as a Fulbright scholar, spending the semester in Baku, Azerbaijan at Baku State University. While in Baku, she had the opportunity to teach and conduct research on secession issues under international law related to Artsakh, nagorno karabakh She has participated as an expert at hearings of the International Criminal Court on various international criminal law issues. Serving as a maritime piracy law expert, she has participated in meetings of the United Nations Contact Group on piracy off the coast of Somalia, as well as in the work of the United Nations Global Counterterrorism Forum. She's a graduate of Cornell Law School and the University of Paris One, and was an associate in the New York City firm of Cleary, Gottlieb, Steen, and Hamilton before joining the ranks of academia full-time. She has published seven books and numerous law review articles. Her latest book, The Syrian Conflict's Impact on International Law, co-authored with Paul Williams and Michael Scharf, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2020. Please type your questions in the chat box and I will facilitate and share this evening 
Dr. Stereo, welcome. And thank you for being here with us this evening. Thank you, Ani, for such a kind introduction. It is truly an honor and a privilege to be with all of you tonight and to address this topic of the Arta conflict, international law, self-determination, and remedial secession. So let me start by offering the following observation. In international law, when we talk about secession and the creation of states more generally speaking, oftentimes we witness the clash of two sets of norms. On the one hand, norms that protect the territorial integrity of, of existing states, and on the other hand, the principle of self-determination, which as you correctly described in your introduction, uh, provides groups that qualify as peoples with the opportunity to self-determine, auto-determine their political fate, which in some instances leads to the creation of new states through this process of secession. So to explain how all of this applies in the Artsakh conflict, allow me to begin by explaining a little bit more about the norms of territorial integrity. Then I will explain in more detail what the principle of self-determination under international law means. I will offer some general observations about secession and discuss a few precedents um, in this field of secession, including the case of Kosovo. And then I will offer some concluding re remarks regarding Arta and how all of this applies to this argument of the ability of the people of Arta to exercise their right to self-determination. So first, one of the most relevant norms in international law is the norm of territorial integrity of states. This norm, which is part of customary law, which is what we call jus cogens, a fundamental norm of international law, basically protects the territorial integrity of existing states. And in some ways, it is really not surprising that this is a fundamental norm of international law because international law in its traditional incarnation is state-centric and protects the rights of existing states. Now, another norm that I should mention that's related to territorial integrity is a principle called uti possidetis, which is this Latin phrase, which means that existing borders cannot be altered through force. The principle of uti possidetis was primarily applied in the decolonization paradigm so that prior colonial boundaries then essentially translated into international frontiers. And we have a very important case from the International Court of Justice, the so-called World Court in The Hague, which held that the principle of uti possidetis is fundamental and might in some instances trump the principle of self-determination because the alternative according to the ICJ is chaos. If we did not protect borders as they existed during colonial time, times and chose to elevate them to the status of international borders, then essentially all of this would be up for grabs, which would result in violence and chaos, which is obviously not a good thing. In the, in the post-decolonization era, we have examples of the application of that principle of UT Posidatis to the former Yugoslavia and the former USSR. If you think about it, when the former Yugoslavia and the former USSR broke up, what happened is that their prior republics or oblasts or regions became independent states. And those boundaries were essentially kept as they existed during the time that those states existed. And this is relevant in the case of Arta because here what happened is that Arta, which had been an autonomous oblast within Azerbaijan, was then essentially incorporated into Azerbaijan when Azerbaijan became an independent state with the breakup of the Soviet Union. Now, these norms of territorial integrity and UT possidatis do conflict and clash to some extent with the principle of self-determination, which on the other hand posits that groups that qualify as peoples have the right to choose how they wish to be governed have the right to choose to auto-determine their political fate. The principle of self-determination was one of the primary ideological vehicles, if you will, during the decolonization of South America during the 19th century. It was an important political ideology 
at the end of World War I, also the underlying theoretical vehicle, which allowed for the creation of new states with the dismantlement of the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the end of World War I, but again, also an important political ideology embraced at the time by the US President Woodrow Wilson, who specifically talk about it in this very famous speech um, in front of the US Congress. And then also by the Soviet leader, Vladimir Lenin, who essentially saw self-determination as a vehicle by which peoples could rid themselves of the bourgeois oppression. Now, up until World War II, self-determination was really more of a political ideology and less a legal norm. However, with the creation of the United Nations and the entire post-World War II international legal order, self-determination becomes a legal principle. The United Nations Charter clearly posits that peoples have a right to self-determination. The right is also clearly stated in other international treaties, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on, economic, on um, Social, Economic, and Cultural Rights. And it is also clearly um, stated in several United Nations General Assembly resolutions, the most famous of which is probably the so-called Friendly Relations Declaration. Now, we know that the principle of self-determination clearly applies in the decolonization paradigm. And we know that colonized peoples have the right to self-determination, which again, in that paradigm of decolonization has led to the creation of new states. But fast forward to the modern era, and there are some lingering questions, if you will, that still exist regarding the contours of this principle of self-determination in the non-decolonization paradigm. So the first question is, what exactly is a people? We know that peoples have a right to self-determination. However, there's no international treaty that clearly defines what a people is. Scholars have talked about a distinction between peoples and minority groups and have posited that while peoples have the right to self-determination and possibly the right to so-called external self-determination, which is exercised through remedial secession, minority groups on the other hand, enjoy other types of protections which are to be exercised internally within their existing parent state. Scholars have also described a people as a group that shares some common objective characteristics, such as a common language, religion, ethnicity, culture, and that also shares the, the, the same subjective belief that they're one and the same. And this obviously is relevant in the case of Artsa because the relevant question here for the purposes of self-determination would be whether the inhabitants of Artsa are a people, because if they're not a people, then they do not have the right to self-determination. Now, the next question regarding self-determination is whether this right applies in the non-decolonization paradigm, and if so, how? And here it's really important to draw a distinction between the so-called right to internal self-determination and then the right to external self-determination. The right to internal self-determination is the right of a people to have their political rights protected within the contours of its existing parent state. So that really most typically translates to the exercise of some kind of political regional autonomy within an existing parent state. The right to external self-determination, however, accrues in situations where the people cannot meaningfully exercise the right to internal self-determination. In other words, the parent state is not willing to respect the people's right to internal self-determination. In that situation, the people can then exercise its right to self-determination externally through the process of remedial secession. Now we have different precedents on this distinction between internal and external self-determination. And the first precedent actually goes all the way back to 1920 and involves the case of the so-called Åland Islands. Åland Islands were islands that at the time belonged to Finland. Now, Finland had just obtained its independence from Russia, so Finland was a relatively new state, and the people of the Åland Islands 
claimed that they were ethnically Swedish and wanted to separate from Finland in order not, not to form their own independent state, but in order to join Sweden. This issue of the Allen Islands was then referred to the, to the then League of Nations, which as most of you know, is the precursor organization to the United Nations. And the League of Nations formed a special committee of experts to study this issue. And the committee ultimately decided that in that instance, since Finland was a democratic nation, which was willing to respect the rights of the Åland Islands inhabitants, they did not have the right to seek independence. They did not right, have the right to separate from Finland. However, one might infer that had Finland not been willing to grant them these internal rights, that this committee of jurists at the League of Nations might have decided differently. The more recent precedent on this distinction between internal and external self-determination is the now famous case of the Canadian Supreme Court in 1998, which was asked to decide whether the Quebecois, the Francophone Quebecois, had the right to self-determination from Canada and what that right meant. And in that case, the Canadian Supreme Court ultimately decides that the Quebecois had meaningful internal self-determination rights within Canada, and because of that, could not ask for more, could not ask for the exercise of external self-determination. However, in the same opinion, the Canadian Supreme Court says that it is possible that oppressed peoples, not just colonized peoples, but oppressed and subjugated peoples also had the right to external self-determination. And this case I would argue is extremely, is an extremely important precedent for ARTSA because the argument there would be that peoples who are oppressed, who have no chance of meaningfully exercising internal self-determination do have the right to external self-determination. I would argue that this view is also supported by the so-called Friendly Relations Declaration, which I briefly mentioned just a few minutes ago. The Friendly Relations Declaration is a General Assembly resolution voted back in 1970, which basically says that peoples who have representative governments, that in those cases, the norm of territorial integrity prevails. However, the implicit argument that we can base on that is that peoples whose governments are not representative of their interests do have rights and do have the right to self-determination that they can exercise in this external way. And by the way, when we talk about, you know, why is it that colonized peoples clearly have the right to exercise self-determination externally, it is because there's this explicit assumption that the colonial governments were not representative of the interests of the colonized peoples and that the colonized peoples clearly did not choose to be represented by these colonial governments. Now, the Canadian Supreme Court in the context of Quebec essentially says it's not just the colonized peoples, it's also peoples who are subjugated and oppressed who might also have similar external self-determination rights if their internal, de internal self-determination rights are not being respected. Now. If a people is exercising external self-determination, it will do that through the process of secession. Secession is not a legal norm. It is not a principle of international law. Instead, it, it is a process by which a people, a group can exercise external self-determination. Secession is a process by which a group separates from the existing parent state, either to form its own independent state or to join an existing state. Even though the prevailing view among international law scholars is that secession is not a right, there are scholars who believe in the so-called just cause theory of secession. The just cause theory of secession posits that peoples who are oppressed can, can, can secede, can exercise secession for a just cause. The just cause stems from the fact that their rights are being oppressed within the state where they're currently living. Now, in the modern day era, the best precedent for secession is the case of Kosovo. So allow me just a few, set, a few minutes to, to, to talk about that. As some of you might know, Kosovo had been an autonomous province of Serbia within the former Yugoslavia. 
The former Yugoslavia broke apart in the early 90s. By 1995, the so-called Dayton Peace Accords were signed, which ended the, the war in the former Yugoslavia. However, the Dayton Peace Accords did not talk about Kosovo and left the Kosovo issue aside. Kosovo by the 90s was, although de jure a part of Serbia, predominantly ethnically Kosovar Albanian, about 90% of the population was Kosovar Albanian by the 1990s. In not, uh, uh, roughly 1998, early 1999, um, there is a very strong independence movement in Kosovo. And as a result, the then president of Serbia, Slobodan Milosevic, reacts with force, um, commits, num you know, orders the commission of numerous human rights violations against the Kosovo Albanians to essentially quash the rebellion. The international community reacts by staging a three-month um, long series of airstrikes against Serbia under the auspices of NATO. In case you're wondering why NATO, it's NATO because at the time the United Nations Security Council was paralyzed and did not authorize the use of force against Serbia because Russia and China were on the Serbian side and were threatening veto. And so because of that, the intervention is staged through NATO. After that, um, peace accords are signed at Rambouillet in the suburbs of Paris, and Kosovo starts being administered by the United Nations, by the international community. So from about 1999 until 2008, Kosovo still de jure legally belongs to Serbia, however, is, it is administered by the international community. In 2008, the Kosovo parliament unilaterally declares independence from Serbia, and Kosovo is then supported by a number of states, including the United States. Fast forward to now, Kosovo has been recognized as an independent state by about 98 or 99 countries. So about half of the countries recognize Kosovo as an independent state. The Kosovo secession from Serbia exercised through this unilateral declaration of independence though, um, has been analyzed by many scholars of international law. And the question is whether this is legal under international law. And I would argue that scholars really, you know, fall on, on, on both sides with many scholars arguing how this is not technically legal under international law, but scholars also arguing that international law really doesn't say anything about secession. That instead international law tolerates secessions that are a fait accompli, already accomplished. And then in the case of, of Kosovo, the secession was basically already accomplished. And as such, international law doesn't specifically condemn this type of secession. The case of Kosovo ended up before the International Court of Justice in The Hague. However, the International Court of Justice was only asked to rule on the legality of the Kosovo unilateral declaration of independence. And so the, the, the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, responded very narrowly, answered this question very narrowly, said there's nothing in international law that prohibits unilateral declarations of independence. And for the most part, the ICJ in that case left questions of self-determination and secession aside and did not say much, did not clarify what secession means in this non-decolonization paradigm and whether peoples truly have the right to external self-determination through the exercise of remedial secession. Nonetheless, even though the International Court of Justice didn't say much about this, we do have the Kosovo precedent, which I would argue is also particularly relevant in the case of Arza. And so with all of that then, how could one construct, you know, best construct arguments in favor of secession for the, or, you know, at least the exercise of self-determination for the people of Arza, in light of relevant international law norms. The most important uh, fact that I would highlight here is the fact that Azerbaijan has no democratic governments. And here I would emphasize that for scholars who believe that self-determination really only means internal self-determination outside of the context of decolonization, I would say, Yes, but internal self-determination presupposes the willingness of the parent state to grant meaningful autonomy to the relevant people. And so here I would argue that since there's no democratic government governance in Azerbaijan, there's really no possibility for any type of meaningful internal self-determination for the people of Artsakh. 
I would also emphasize the severe oppression of human rights that has taken place by the Azeri authorities. I would emphasize the ongoing blockade that has now been happening for the past 88 days, which has threatened food supplies and really basic human rights of the people of Arta. And then I would emphasize the campaign of ethnic cleansing, which has taken place in Arta, where the Azeri government has tried to essentially ethnically cleanse the area and drive ethnic Ar Armenians outside of Arta. I would also emphasize the international community's involvement here, in particular the role of the so-called Minsk group. And the reason I emphasize this is that in the Kosovo case, some states that supported the independence of Kosovo have emphasized the international community's involvement as one of the factors as to why it is justified that Kosovo should secede from Serbia, and notably the United States, our State Department, when the United States um, recognized Kosovo, it specifically emphasized the international community's involvement. And so here for Arta, I would also emphasize the fact that the international community has been involved in attempting to resolve this conflict. I would also emphasize, going back to the principle of UT Posidatis, which I mentioned earlier, the fact that Arta had been an autonomous oblast or region within Azerbaijan, and that there's no reason why why couldn't apply this principle of UT Posidatis to essentially elevate prior administrative boundaries to the status of international borders to Arta as an, as an autonomous oblast within Azerbaijan. And so all of this to say that I do believe that a valid international law argument can be made in favor of secession, the exercise of external self-determination for the people of Arta. You would need to argue that the people of Arta clearly are a people for the purposes of self-determination, that they, they share common objective characteristics as well as common a common subjective belief that they're one and the same. You would have to argue that there is really no possibility of them being able to meaningfully exercise the right to internal self-determination within Azerbaijan, because Azerbaijan is not a democratic state, has been oppressing human rights in Arta, has engaged in this blockade, has also engaged in, an, in, a, in a campaign of ethnic cleansing. You would argue that this is consistent with international communities' prior involvement in the case of Kosovo, that it is not contrary with the principle of UT Posidatis, and in a sense, that if the people of Arta were to declare that they're seceding, that international law, law would tolerate this type of secession because there's nothing in, in line with the Kosovo precedent. There is nothing in international law that clearly affirmatively prohibits secession. And so I do think that there are valid international law-based arguments that could be made in favor of supporting the people of Arta and their quest for self-determination and secession. Now, I want to end my remarks with a word of caution though, because although there are important international law arguments in favor, I do think that it's important to also remind everybody that secession is not exactly a popular concept among existing states. And that we saw tremendous pushback recently when the people of Catalonia tried to exercise external self-determination through this process of secession. And that there were similar pushback where the people of when the people of Kurdistan tried to exercise their rights and secede from Iraq. And so the reality of the situation is that for a group, for a people to be able to secede from their parent state, the political, the, the geopolitical realities also have to align. And I think it's particularly important to have the support of some powerful states, like, for example, the United States. So with that, I will pause and I will take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Professor Stereo. Uh, we do have quite a few questions here. So um, I will begin with our first question. Um, territorial integrity is an interesting concept. Uh, the Sykes a uh, Picot agreement created a number of countries at the end of the World War that had not existed before. A practice implemented by despots and others alike. 
So people who had never lived in the Middle East decided to create countries and put people who had been at each other's throats the day before as new countrymen. Now these borders become inviolable and the people within those borders get to suffer the consequences. A, uh, what are your thoughts on this concept where lines drawn on a map by third party supersede the wishes of the people who fall on different sides of those lines? And B, it is clear why nations hold this principle so dearly, but how about the will of the people? One that we may argue is of the utmost importance. Yeah, thank you. Those are those are really excellent questions. And I think they're, you know, sort of directly relevant to some of my um, remarks. So first, this idea of borders randomly drawn by essentially world powers, whether it be in the Middle East or in Africa. Um, I do think that this concept is unfair, frankly, ridiculous, and has resulted in violence and civil wars and, and other types of conflicts. Um, you know, one state that I can mention is, for example, Sudan, the state of Sudan, pursuant to this idea that um, territorial borders would be drawn prior to um, uh, past colonial boundaries, there was a decision to essentially create the state of, state of Sudan as one state that never worked. Fast forward to now, and we see that there's been tremendous violence. South Sudan seceded from Sudan. Now we have two states, but there's still violence, still conflict ongoing. The International Court of Justice, in this case that I mentioned in my remarks, involving Burkina Faso and Mali in the 1970s, essentially said like, yeah, that's unfair. However, the alternative where everything would be up for grabs is even worse because that would invariably result in chaos and warfare and violence. So I agree with you that this is unfair. And I agree with you that to some extent, it is important to respect the will of the people. Again, you know, balanced against the dangers, the risks associated with saying everything is up for grabs. We're just going to have all sorts of groups, you know, exercise their right to self-determination and determine where they want to draw boundaries. It wouldn't necessarily go well, you know, everywhere in the world. But I do, you know, but that leads me to your other question about the will of the people. This is precisely what the principle of self-determination stands for, that the people should be the ones to decide how they wish to be governed. Now, again, the elephant in the room is how do we reconcile boundaries and territorial integrity against the wishes, the will of a people when the people through the exercise of external self-determination tries to disrupt existing boundaries. Now, the, the best answer I can give is that, you know, th the best way to do this is through a peaceful negotiation and through a referendum which I fully recognize in the case of Artsa might not be possible because Azerbaijan has not shown a willingness to negotiate you know, about anything really. But, but the best case is where there's a situation where this can be negotiated. One example of that that I could mention is the proposed secession of Scotland from the United Kingdom. Some of you might remember that the people of Scotland held a referendum a few years, you know, five, six years ago, um, about independence and the government of the United Kingdom had promised in advance to respect the result of the referendum. And in the case of Canada, in the case of Quebec, the Canadian government had also presumably been willing to respect the results of the referendum. So the best case scenario, how do we reconcile territorial integrity and self-determination, the will of the people is through a negotiation and through peaceful means, recognizing that that is not always possible. Now, one other thing that I would just mention is that I do think another important argument in favor of the will of the people is that I would argue that international law has evolved from its traditional pre-World World War II incarnation, where international law was extremely state-centric and seen for the most part as a conflict of interstate dispute resolution, to the current version of international law, which is much more focused on human rights, the protection of human rights, and the protection of group rights. And so I think that's an important argument in favor of, I don't want to say altogether abandoning the principle of territorial integrity, but really tempering the principle of, of territorial integrity with the will of the people and thus self-determination. Thank you for that thorough response and your insights. Um, we have our second question here. 
Um, Artsakh followed the USSR constitution and legally ceded from the Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan before Azerbaijan itself ceded from the USSR. Why is Artsakh considered part of the independent Azeri Republic if it followed the constitution of the parent state and ceded from the USSR legally? Yeah, so that's a great question. I'm certainly not an expert on USSR constitutional law. However, that is a very important question because it, if it's true that Arta, you know, seceded from legally pursuant to the USSR constitution, seceded from um, Azerbaijan, then this whole question of self-determination is irrelevant to some extent because then it becomes a question of domestic law. So again, to go back to my example of Scotland, when Scotland proposed to secede, the UK government said, fine, you can have a referendum and, and you can you know, tell us what you think. And we agree to respect the results of the referendum. That is a purely domestic law issue. International law does not concern itself with that question because then that question is something that's resolved within the boundaries of that sovereign nation. And so you are right to bring this up that if this is the case, then this whole issue of self-determination under international law really becomes irrelevant. So thank you for, you know, thank you for highlighting that. Thank you. Uh, we are waiting on question number three here. Okay. Procedurally, oops, okay, hold on one second. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, let's say we would like to start this process, the secession process um, tomorrow. Procedurally, how can Artsakh request for remedial secession? Yeah, so again, the best way to accomplish this is through a referendum. Now, I understand that in 1991, there already had been a referendum where the people of Artsakh already voted in favor of independence, but procedurally, a referendum is the best democratic vehicle for the exercise of remedial secession. The referendum then could be followed by a declaration of independence following the Kosovo precedent. And that's why I think Kosovo is such an important precedent here because there we see a unilateral de declaration of independence and we see basically the ICJ saying, you know, international law doesn't really say anything about this, hence this is tolerated. So I would say a referendum and a declaration of independence. Now, again, in an ideal world, this would be negotiated with Azerbaijan. Um, and so I think procedurally, it might be important to at least attempt that, knowing that it's probably not going to lead anywhere. And then also perhaps involve the Minsk group, which I know also hasn't been like super effective. However, procedurally, I do think it's important to also involve them to essentially present this case of, look, we are trying to negotiate a solution here. You know, we are ready to negotiate. Here's Here are the contours of our demand. Here's a referendum that clearly shows that the will of the people is to secede. So we do not have a democratic solution by way of referendum, because one side of the equation is not a democratic state. So what is our plan B? Well, so the, the referendum, you know, the referendum would have to, so then, you know, there, there are all sorts of questions my, one might ask about the referendum, like who are the people voting in the referendum? How do you draw those boundaries? But ultimately it would have to be the people living in Arta who, who we're claiming are the relevant people, if you will, for the purposes of the secession. Now, I understand that, you know, Azerbaijan, which is not a democratic state, would never allow the referendum in the areas that it controls. So that is clearly a major stumbling block. Um, I wonder if there might be other way of consulting with the inhabitants of the region to, to get their view more formally. But absent that, then I would say, um, the relevant step, I go back to, um, you know, this unilateral, you know, declaration of independence um, and, and a formal request to the Minsk group to begin secession separation negotiations. Okay. Thank you. Um, if secession is tolerated uh, when a fait accompli, why is Artsakh still struggling as it has been a de facto nation for well over 30 years, having fought to prevent ethnic cleansing and have the right to self-determination? Yeah, I mean, this this is where I think geopolitics get involved. So even if there's a clear legal case towards secession, 
Um, geopolitics have, in this instance, I would argue, contributed to the fact that this has been a so-called frozen conflict where um, everything has been in limbo for several decades now. There are other examples of frozen conflicts that we have throughout the world. Um, Kurdistan might be one. Um, the so-called Republic of Srpska, which is the eastern part of Bosnia, which also de facto functions as a separate state. Northern Cyprus, which also functions de facto as a separate state. And I'm not here, you know, announcing anything about like whether these um, um, entities have legitimate claims for secession. I'm simply observing that there are other parts of the world where we have similar frozen conflicts. And so I think here, because of the role of Russia and Turkey and because of geopolitics, unfortunately, Arta has become a victim of you know, international politics, and we haven't been applied, we haven't been able to apply international law as, as, as clearly as we should. It's clear. Um, this next question is in reference um, to your examples of Quebec and Catalonia. Um, so Quebec and Catalonia are interesting cases, but there was no killing and atrocities occurring in either setting of the respective parent state. Uh, we can argue that they may have suffered unfair treatment by their respective parent states. Uh, but Quebec City and Barcelona are free and thriving cities. We cannot say the same for Shushi. Um, so it is difficult to see a one-on-one -on -one comparison with Artsakh. What suggestions do you have to change this narrative? Yeah, and you know, so again, great. You know, these are these are really like excellent questions. So 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 thank you for such excellent questions. Um, I did not, you know, use the examples of Quebec and Catalonia to suggest any type of a direct parallel with Arta. And I actually think that in the case of Catalonia, its case for secession is very weak because again, international law and self determination is clear that it's really only oppressed, subjugated peoples who have no meaningful chance of exercising internal self determination. It's only those peoples whose right to external self determination through remedial secession are accrued. And so, in the case of Catalonia, I think it's very difficult to argue that Spain is a non democratic region which has severely oppressed the rights of the Catalan people. You know, Catalonia has been a province, uh, you know, a, a part of Spain, which has enjoyed tremendous autonomy. Um, you know, the autonomy was somewhat revoke, revoked in the wake of the, the crisis, but up until then, it is very difficult to argue that the Catalan did not have their right to internal self-determination. And regarding the, the people of Quebec, you can definitely make the same argument, which is what the Canadian Supreme Court did. The Canadian Supreme Court said that the people of Quebec had their rights to internal self-determination respected very well within the state of Canada. These are just the reason, for example, I'm using Quebec is that what's interesting about that case is that the Canadian Supreme Court clearly um, distinguishes between internal and, and external self-determination and suggests that non-colonized but oppressed peoples may have a right to external self-determination. So that is actually extremely important precedent for Arta because Arta is not a colony, right? So the, the, the whole colonization paradigm doesn't apply. I would use the Canadian Supreme Court opinion as precedent to say they are subjugated, they are oppressed, they have suffered from major human rights violations. And so in line with the Canadian Supreme Court opinion, they have the right to external self-determination. I would say that the Catalonia case does, even though again, it is very, very different, but it does remind us of the reluctance of states and the reluctance of, inter of the international community to support secession. Because if you think about it, even if, if we say it's totally legitimate in the case of Arta, it is a scary proposition for all existing states to broadly support the right to secession because they could have like illegitimate secessionist groups functioning within their borders. And if we create some kind of a normative framework for secession, then those groups would also be able to complain and say, well, we also have the right to secede. And so, yes, I completely agree with you. Arta is very, very different from Quebec and Catalonia, but I think these cases are important as comparisons, as reminders of how we apply the right to secession um, within the international community. Thank you for clarifying that argument. Um, back to Azerbaijan. Um, the world has seen how Azerbaijan has been treating the Armenians of Artsakh while not a part of Azerbaijan. 
how would the international community tolerate seeing Artsakh as part of Azerbaijan? Yet this view persists today. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, so so first of all, I think that unfortunately, um, Artsakh has become a little bit of a forgotten conflict. Um, and I think that's really, really unfortunate. And, you know, especially nowadays with the focus of you on Ukraine, we haven't seen as much media coverage, for example, about the blockade, which is which is truly, truly unfortunate. As I said earlier, I believe that Artsa is truly a victim of geopolitics, because if you think about it, two powerful countries are also involved, Russia and Turkey. Turkey obviously, you know, clearly supports Azerbaijan. I would say that the Russian role has been a lot more nuanced. I think Russia to some extent has supported Armenia, but has also been, you know, somewhat supportive of Azerbaijan to some extent and has been literally uh, trying to exercise all sorts of influence over Armenia in exchange for some support in in this conflict. Um, I think the West is also somewhat divided on this. You know, Azerbaijan is a very interesting country. As you mentioned in the intro, I had the chance to spend about six months there as a Fulbright scholar. Um, The Azerbaijani president has somehow forged ties to Russia, the United States, and Israel. Azerbaijan, I think, might be the only Muslim country in the world that actually has diplomatic relations with Israel. They're like Azeri students who go on scholarships to study in Israel. And so not to say that he's a good guy, obviously he's not, but in, in, in terms of geopolitics, he's been able to forge these ties. And then Azerbaijan has the oil and the gas, which also obviously influences geopolitics in this, in, in, in this region. And so Arta, unfortunately, has fallen victims to these geopolitics, w- which have been you know, a lot more supportive of Azerbaijan in this instance because of Azerbaijan's Azerbaijan's role in the region and also the fact that it has all these valuable natural resources. Thank you. Um, We are getting more questions that are coming through as we formulate these. Okay. Um, While true that NATO stepped in to enforce the ICJ ruling due to UN dysfunction, there was a political will there by the West. This, as you alluded, does not exist for Artsakh for a variety of geopolitical reasons. Assuming that we have an ICJ ruling for external self-determination for Artsakh, how would this actually be implemented given the Azeri belligerence and the absence of the NATO muscle? Yeah, I mean, so, so first of all, like legally speaking, if there were an ICJ opinion clearly recognizing the right to external self-determination for oppressed peoples, that would obviously be tremendously important in this instance, because then you could rely on this ICJ precedent, which by the way is binding on all UN states because the ICJ is the judicial organ of the United Nations. And you'd be able to point to that and say, aha, we now know clearly that international law supports the right to external self-determination for these oppressed subjugated peoples. However, you do, you know, you are correct to point out that it wouldn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily follow that the people of Arta would be able to immediately exercise their right to self-determination. Because again, the exercise of this right through remedial secession is linked to geopolitics and it is linked to the support or lack of support by the great powers. One of the main reasons that Kosovo was able to sort of so easily declare independence from Serbia is that it had the support of the United States, right? The United States basically within minutes of the Kosovo Declaration of Independence recognized Kosovo as an independent state. And some of my um, friends and colleagues in international law have actually joked that it's like the State Department that drafted the Kosovo Declaration of Independence. So the reality is that it would be difficult to implement the ICJ ruling, but at the same time, I do think that it would be tremendously important to have the ICJ ruling because then um, if any unilateral processes are initiated, um, if ARSA were to say, okay, we are separating following the Kosovo precedent and we now have this ICJ decision, it would be a lot more difficult for countries to respond and say, no, you can't do that because there would be a clearly articulated right to external self-determination. So there would be challenges, but I do think that this would be tremendously helpful. Yeah, 
Thank you for that reality check. <laughs> um, we have a few more questions here. Um, these are great questions, by the way. Thank you, everyone, for submitting them. Um, given the votes in the 1980s by the Nagorno-Karabakh Assembly to join Armenia, while both were still part of the Soviet Union, can you suggest that Karabakh never joined a soon-to-be independent Azerbaijan? Yeah, so I mean, um, sure. I think there are lots of arguments one can make as to why Arta, you know, does not sort of automatically um, belong to Azerbaijan. If you go back in, in history, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, Stalin basically decided that Artsakh would become a part of Azerbaijan within the USSR. And he did this purposely because at the time Artsakh was inhabited by predominantly by ethnic Armenians. And Stalin didn't want any of the republics to be ethnically pure because he didn't want rebellion against the Soviet rule, against the Moscow rule. And so he sort of like arbitrarily decided that Artsakh would be a part of Azerbaijan. If you look further back in history, I think it's fair to say that the region was sort of conquered at different times by the Persian Empire, by the Ottoman Empire, and then the, the, the Russian Empire, and then the USSR. So one, one thing we can look at is, okay, Stalin sort of arbitrarily said this is going to be a part of um, Azerbaijan. However, even within Azerbaijan, it was an autonomous oblast, an autonomous region. And so there's this sense that it was still separate within Azerbaijan. Then we have the breakup of the USSR. And so in the context of that breakup, as I mentioned earlier, there was this tendency to apply the principle of UT Posidatis and to say that these prior uh, Republican boundaries, internal boundaries now become international borders. But as I also mentioned during my talk, there's nothing to suggest that it had to be the republics. Why not the autonomous oblast, right? Like you could say, UT Posidatis applies to Artak because that was this clearly delineated autonomous oblast. And then if you add to that, the basically the, the expression of the people in the late 80s to be a part of Armenia, I think that bolsters this argument that there's really nothing in international law that would be contrary to this assertion that Arta, you know, never really should have been a part of the independent state of Azerbaijan when, when Azerbaijan was created in the early 90s. So that's also another, you know, very, very important question. Thank you for the historical context as well. We appreciate that. We have a few more questions. And if you do have questions, please do not directly send them to me. Um, send them into the chat box in general. We have someone facilitating those for us. Or you can also send them directly to Ara Nazarian um, at the top here, who's one of the hosts. So um, we have a few more questions here. I will continue on here. Um, are individuals in Artsakh able to submit affidavits of repudiation? similar to an American state national status determination process? Um, the question then would be like, where would those affidavits be submitted? Um, so individuals as a general matter, individuals do have the ability to submit statements of that sort to the European Court of Human Rights. So if they're proceedings in the European Court of Rights, typically individuals have the opportunity to submit statements. If there are proceedings before the International Court of Justice in The Hague, which I mentioned earlier, there, private individuals don't automatically get the right to submit statements. However, groups can submit briefs, legal briefs, so-called amicus briefs. We have that practice also here in the United States. So groups can submit briefs and essentially like position statements to the International Court of Justice. So in the International Court of Justice, it would have to be through a group and it would have to be essentially a position statement rather than just like an individual affidavit. Thank you for that clarification. Um, can you suggest that a newly independent Azerbaijan in the 90s never had de facto control over Nagorno-Karabakh and therefore ask what are the legal implications? Yeah, so, you know, that goes back to, we've discussed this, I think, like a couple of, you know, through, through a couple of other questions. So that, that gets to the question of it, is it, was, was Arta really legally, formally a part of Azerbaijan was, when Azerbaijan was created as a state? If, for example, you argue that Azerbaijan really never had effective control over um, Arta back then and that the people of Artsakh had already expressed the willingness first to join Armenia later in 1991 to, um, you know, they, they declared independence. 
Um, I, I think, you know, this question goes to the process of the creation of states. And I think, again, there are, there are very valid ways of, um, you know, questioning whether Azerbaijan, as it was created in the early 90s, should have incorporated Arta. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a few more questions here as it's coming through. Okay. Nachichevan, another previously Armenian populated territory, has been an external oblast of the independent state of Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan has changed the Nachichevan status to not even have an internal precedence for any status for Artsakh as part of Azerbaijan. Um, this clearly, the question's coming in hot. <laughs> this clearly articulates the mindset of the Azeri leadership. Can you comment on this? Yeah, so that, you know, why this is relevant from, from an international law standpoint, it's relevant is because it supports this argument that the people of Artsa have no chance of meaningfully exercising internal self-determination within Azerbaijan, because the Azeri government has been revoking the autonomy of all of these autonomous provinces. They're not a democratic regime. They've abused human rights. They've imposed a blockade. And so if you, if you clearly establish that there's no chance of having internal self-determination rights suspected, then you get to this threshold of, okay, we are an oppressed subjugated people and we should be able to exercise our rights to external self-determination through the process of remedial secession. Can one argue that states have an obligation to not recognize Azerbaijan's sovereignty over Artsakh because they have a duty to prevent genocide? Yeah, that's actually also a great question. So um, traditionally, under international law, we say that recognition is, you know, when, when one state chooses to recognize or not recognize another state, the traditional view is that this is a political act, that recognition is a political act, that it is not governed by international law, and that basically states are sovereign and they can do whatever they want, they can choose to recognize or not to recognize. That's the traditional view. However, in the more recent era, we have seen instances of states urging others and passing resolutions in international organizations to say that regimes that are not democratically elected, regimes that come to power through extra constitutional means, such as a military coup, ought not be recognized. So we have this example, for example, in the case of Haiti, the Organization of American States back in the early 90s, there had been a military coup in Haiti, a new regime came into power, and the Organization of American States voted this resolution saying, basically, we're not going to recognize this new um, you know, unconstitutional regime that came to power in Haiti. And so a similar type of an argument could be made with respect to um, the Azeri sovereignty over Arta to say, how because this is an illegitimate, essentially occupation, that states have a duty not to recognize that type of you know, forceful sovereignty over an area that's not legitimately part of, um, part of Azerbaijan. Okay, thank you for that. Um, another question referring back to the Basque country. Um, can the Basque country autonomy be used as an example and are there any lessons from there? Yeah, so the Basque country, what's interesting about that is I had mentioned the case of Kosovo before as, you know, as possibly a very important precedent for Arta. What's interesting about Kosovo is that Spain is one of you know, a few Western countries that has actually to date not recognized Kosovo precisely because of the Basque country and then you know, more recently with, with Catalonia, but really the Basque country because this was back in 2008 prior to the crisis in Catalonia. And so if any, you know, with respect to the Basque people, I would argue that this is kind of like Catalonia, that they've, they've had autonomy, their rights are being respected in Spain. Spain is a democratic country that has no history of human rights abuses. Well, you know, yes, maybe under Franco, but recently it has no history of human rights abuses. And so that, that their situation is just different. You know, th they can meaningfully exercise internal self-determination, whereas the people of Artsakh cannot under the current Azeri rule. Thank you. Um, we have one last question here and we'll conclude uh, our evening. Thank you so much. Um, on February 22nd, the International Court of Justice made a ruling against Azerbaijan. How does it get executed? Why even have this court if there is no enforcement? 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think somebody, you know, a little bit earlier kind of alluded to this. The big problem of international law is the lack of enforcement mechanisms. And another big problem is that in our current international system, we have these great powers that have veto control in the United Nations Security Council that can basically block actions that they do not like for any sort of reason. And so we have this very important problem in international law of enforcement. It is true that ICJ rulings and orders are legally binding, but it's also true that the ICJ has literally no means of enforcing their own judgments. One example that I give you that I can give you of that is in the in the mid '80s. Those of you who are old enough to remember, um, the um, uh, Nicaragua sued the United States in the ICJ because at the time the uh, the United States had been supporting this Contras regime um, in Nicaragua, fighting against the at the time government of Nicaragua. And Nicaragua sued the, the United States in the ICJ. The ICJ ended up basically boycotting the proceedings. The ICJ issued a ruling against the United States, and nothing really happened. Right? The, the ruling clearly said the United. United States is violating Nicaragua's sovereignty, the United States should stop, but there's really like no specific way for the ICJ to enforce that. And so not to be, you know, I, I hate to end on a negative note, but it is really true that in order for uh, movements, entities, groups to be able to, to meaningfully exercise their rights, they must have the support of the international community, and they really have to have the support of some of the great powers, such as the United States. Thank you, thank you for that. And, and thank you so much uh, for all this information, for diving into um, self-determination and remedial secession. We really appreciate you. In closing, we just want to thank you for your insightful comments and for all of our guests and for joining and actively participating. These were great questions um, and it was a much needed dialogue for us in our community. So we really appreciate you, Professor Stereo. Thank you for having me.